Welcome everybody to tutorial number two of this tutorial series on R. Um, we're gonna get into or get our hands dirty in, in uh, this tutorial with actually some basics of coding in R. Um, as you can see in front of uh, in front of me, I have R Studio open with the R code that we're gonna be working through. And as you probably already know, these are all the files of this tutorial series are on our GitHub. If you haven't downloaded them, uh, please do so. Uh, the instructions are in the first video. And then we have our console, and then I've minimized the other two panes in our studio. So today um, has four parts. Part one, we're going to go over some of the basics of programming in R. And part two, we're going to talk about installing and loading packages, which are um, the software that um, have been developed by others um, to actually run many statistical analyses and do you know fancy plots. R of course has built-in statistical functions but many of the um, functions that you need to analyze data are not actually built in and are um, have been created by others through these things called packages. Part three, we talk about um, at least how I troubleshoot problems. Um, you know, I run into problems all the time in R. How do you do certain things? Um, and so I'm constantly looking up solutions to problems, and I'm going to show you at least sort of my way of doing things. And then finally, very briefly, I'm going to explain how you disable scientific notation um, in R. I personally dislike it. When um, when I see results reported in scientific notation, I find it just requires me to think more when I see a, a decimal place in scientific notation. So I'm going to just show you how to turn it off because I always turn it off since I don't like it. Okay, let's begin. So part one, um, basics of uh, the R programming language. So I have a lot of uh, comments. These are what are called comments, the things you see in green. Um, and I've commented a lot throughout all of the R code that I've shared with you so that after this video, if you're going back through the code, you can kind of see what I'm doing and my reasoning for the things that I'm doing. Um, so why don't we just begin with what comments are? So to actually make a comment, you put a hashtag and, and you can see once you place a hashtag it actually it makes everything to the right of the hashtag green and the hashtag is basically a commenting uh, symbol I'm just going to open this up a little bit so you can read along as I talk so these comments allow you to make notes as you're writing um, I use a lot of them personally um, I'm using a lot I'm using much more than I would um, personally in this in this code because of the fact that I'm trying to teach you guys how to use R. But uh, even for my own personal code, when I'm analyzing data, I use a lot of comments. And the reason why um, I personally do it is because I find it's really helpful once you go back and look at old code to figure out, you know, what was I doing, you know, months or even years ago. Um, so I find it very helpful. And the way the commenting symbol works is that anything to the right of the hashtag is not actually read by R. So let's go down to here. You see I've defined a variable called x equals 1, but I put a comment in front of it. So let's actually run that code and see what happens. You see that actually um, no object x was found um, because of the fact that because of the hashtag there, um, R did not read anything um, to the right of that. And let's do the other line. If I run basically the same line of code without the hashtag, you'll find that R, oops, sorry, that R is able to read the function and it, um, it encodes that X equals one. So that's basically how comments work. It's a way to um, have R ignore the things that you don't want it to process. Another thing that you're gonna see a lot um, is this symbol here, this, uh, of arrow. I, I've already even used it um, when I was defining x. That symbol basically is the function we use to define variables in R. In many ways it means equals, um, but in other ways it doesn't actually mean equals. I personally like to think of this arrow symbol as x is y, not that x equals y. 
The reason why is in R, if you're actually asking whether or not x equals y, what you're kind of asking is what's called a logical statement, which can either be true or false. It's either true or false that x is the same value as y. And R actually has a totally different symbol for that kind of logical statement, which I've highlighted right down there. It's two equal sign, two equal signs. So why don't we actually uh, show you an example of this? So um, here we're on line 46. So we're going to call, we're going to run that line of code. It says y is one. So we, we see y is one. Um, and we already know that x equals one. Uh, and we're going to say, but we're going to just define x as 1 again. We're saying x is 1. Now we want to know, does x equal y? So let's run, run this line of code. And you'll see that r returns back a value saying that it's true. Yes, x actually equals y because they're both the value of 1. Now, what happens if I define y as 2? So I just did that. y is 2. Uh, and we know that x is 1. So let's run this logical statement again, and then it's going to return back a value of false. So there's just a very simple example of showing kind of the difference between the arrow symbol and um, the sort of logical operator of, you know, equals. Okay, now I'd like to talk about types of data. And there are more or less six major types of data in R. The first is numeric, second is character, third is a logical um, Type of data. The fourth is a factor. The fifth is an ordinal um, data. And then I guess the sixth would be missing values, which have a particular type of um, encoding in R. And we're going to go through all of these. So for numeric, let's sort of scroll down. Uh, for numeric, uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. So numerics are uh, any kind of number. And uh, to show you an example on line 65, you'll see that there's this little symbol called C bracket, and then within the brackets we have various numbers. I'm going to go into detail what that's, what that, when you have a C with the brackets. Basically, it's a, it allows you to create a, what's called a vector, which is just a fancy term for a, um, a, uh, a set of what are called objects, and the objects could be anything from a numeric, a character, a logical, or whatever. But it's basically, a, you can think of it as like a, a set of, of various objects. So what we're saying here is X is this set of objects, one, two, and three. So let's actually run that line of code so you kind of see what it, what that does. We just ran that line of code. Let's see what X is. It's one, two, and three. Okay. And now you can actually, there are built-in functions where you can see whether or not um, a particular object, in this case X, is a numeric. So is it numeric? And then R tells you, yeah, it's actually numeric. It's true. Similarly, character, um, uh, I guess not similarly, but anyway, um, a character is in some programming languages called a string. Um, you can make a character, it could be actual letters, but actually you can make numbers as characters. And the way you make a character is by putting quotations around it. So let's do the same thing. We're creating a vector with two objects in it, which we're, um, which are going to be characters. And the two objects are hello and, this, uh, and then world. So let's run X again. And it says there's two objects within X called hello and world. And then again, um, there's built-in functions. Uh, to see whether or not the object is a character. So, and of course, it says true because these are characters. And then, you know, just for the sake of teaching, is it a numeric? No, it's not. It's false. Okay. Um, and then, again, just to drive the point home, you should think of character not as simply the difference between numbers versus letters. Um, it's actually a, a type of format. So you can actually force R to treat numbers as a character. And that's what we're doing right now by putting quotations around the, the numbers. So here you can see X is now um, a vector consisting of three characters of one, two, and three. Then to show you that that's how R is actually reading it, is it a character? Yes, it is. True. Is it a numeric? No, it's not. False. Okay, what's a logical? So logical is basically what these sort of true false statements. And you can make a vector consisting of a bunch of different logical statements, either true or false, which is what we're doing here in line 81. 
So we're saying X is this vector consisting of a bunch of logical objects. Oops. Um, so let's see what X is. True, false, true, true. Great. And then again, built-in function, is it logical? Yes, X is a logical uh, object. What's a factor? So let's take a little bit of time talking about factors, actually. Just so don't get confused. So line 87. So what a factor is, is you can turn any variable, be it a character or a numeric, into a nominal variable. So those of you who use SPSS will, are probably very familiar with this. Um, when you want to do an analysis of variance, you might have a predictor that is a categorical variable, let's say, you know, sex or um, different treatment groups, and you want, it's, it's a nominal variable, so there's different um, there's different categories, and you want to basically code those categories, which you're then going to feed into your analysis. So what we're going to do is create a, a vector consisting of a bunch of different numbers. So you can see here, X is a bunch of different numbers. And then, I'm just going to scroll up, it's easier to read. Um, so you can actually convert those numerical values in X, this vector um, called X, into different levels of a factor. So and you use this factor function here. So you factor bracket, and then you put the object that you want to factor within the brackets. So we're saying X is the factor of X. So we're just basically changing X into a factored variable. So let's see what that does. So you see um, here that it has all the same values. Um, the same numerics uh, or the same numerical um, values, but R is interpreting these numerical values as different levels, and it's levels 0, 1, and 2, and these are what, what you might call dummy codes for different um, categories. So there's a category called 0, a category called 1, and a category called 2. And you can actually give labels to these numbered levels to make them a bit more meaningful. And the way you do that is just by adding a few other functions or sub-functions within the, the, the factor function. So it's the same, same function we're doing. We're saying factor X, but we can actually define the levels, levels explicitly, um, which is what we do here. You say levels equals, and then you define the vector. So um, in this case, we have three values within X. It's 0, 1, and 2. But let's say we had 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We could do the same thing here. We'd say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then we can give labels to, uh, to those levels. And the order that you put the um, labels actually matters. So the first label corresponds to the first level within this vector here that you've defined. The second label corresponds to the second um, uh, level within this vector here. And the third label corresponds to naturally the third level that you've defined here um, above. So let's see what that looks like. So what this should do, um, if I've coded it properly, is that everything that's a zero should be named placebo. Everything that's a one should be named treatment A. And everything that's a two should be labeled treatment B. So let me, let's run that, this code. And now let's see what a little bit more space and what do you know it did exactly what we want it to do so you can you can sort of see the first one is zero and it's now calling it placebo the second one is two it's calling it treatment b this the third one is a one it's calling it treatment a etc and then again it shows you the actual levels and it and it corresponds exactly to the dummy coded version of this um of this factored variable so zero is now called placebo, that's its label. Um, one is, its label is treatment A, and two, its label is treatment B. Now, another thing that you need to know about factored variables is that the reference category really matters, and this is something we're gonna get into, or you'll see why it matters once we actually do certain analyses, particularly um, an analysis of variance, although also in linear regression, it matters too what the reference category is. And in R, the reference category is the first level you listed when um, you look up the levels after you apply what's called the attributes function of a variable. So if you want to know what is the reference um, level, one way to do it, there's many different ways, but the, the way I like to do it is just run the attributes function. So you attributes bracket, and then you put the object that you want to know the attributes of. 
um, within the brackets. So we run that little line of code and there you go. So it's attributes of X. It says it's got different levels, placebo, treatment A, treatment B, and it's telling you what it is, type of thing it is, the type of data. It's, it's a factored data. And you can tell by applying this function what the reference category is because it's the first label you see, in which case placebo is, um, is the um, reference category um, that R uh, is going to be uh, using if you ever use this, this variable in, in an analysis. And as I say here, by default, all R sets the reference category to the first value you put in this levels function. So going up here, when you're defining the levels of the variable, whatever number you put first, R by default is going to take that as the reference category and the label that you apply to that reference category will um, be applied to it. Now let's say that um, for whatever reason you want to actually change or reset the reference category after defining your your factored variable. Well thankfully R actually has a little function. It's called relevel. Um, and so it's relevel bracket and then you define the you put the variable that you want to relevel and then you manually set the reference uh, category. In this case, we want to change the reference category from placebo to treatment A. So let's actually run this function. Okay. So you can see here that after applying that function, we've actually switched placebo and treatment A. So as whereas above placebo was the reference category by using the relevel function and saying that the reference category is treatment A, we've changed the the um, the reference category. And again, if you apply the attributes function, you'll see that that actually was um, encoded. Okay, uh, ordinal variables um, are a variant on. Um, on factored variables, uh, except that they are rank ordered, meaning that they um, they have a, um, a well a rank order structure, meaning there's things that are um, less than and greater than or smaller or, or larger than, and um, that actually does matter um, in in an analysis whether that be your independent variable or your dependent variable if it's ordinal. So. The way you actually define an ordinal variable is using the same factor function, which I'm going to show you in a second, except there's another setting, um, uh, which is called ordered, and you just set that to true, and I'm going to show you in a second. Um, the reference category for an ordinal variable is, is, again, just the first value that you put in the levels function, um, and for whatever reason, R doesn't allow you to use the relevel function. Um, it'll just give you an error message. So let's let's actually show um, an, what an, how you create an ordinal variable and how you change the reference um, category of an ordinal variable. So again, let's let's say x is just this vector. Oops, it's just this vector consisting of a bunch of different numbers. Great. Um, and then you'll see it's a very similar function. We're saying factor x, giving it levels zero, one, and two, and we're giving them labels. So zero is going to be low risk. One is going to be moderate risk and two is going to be high risk. And the key difference here is we're actually telling R that this is an ordered set, meaning that this is going to be an ordinal variable. So let's run that and let's see now what X is. So notice, um, just like above with a regular factored variable, um, all the zeros are low risk, all the ones are considered are labeled high moderate risk, and all the twos are labeled high risk. But then crucially down here, when you actually look at the levels, and this is the difference between an ordered versus non-ordered factored variable, is that R actually um, encodes um, this order within them. So low risk is less than moderate risk, which is less than high risk. Now, just for the sake of teaching, just to show you that, let's say for whatever reason you want to change the reference category to high risk, you actually can't use the relevel function. So I'll show you what happens when we try to do that. You get an error message which says relevel only for unordered factors. So clearly that didn't work. So if you want to actually change the reference category for an ordinal variable, you kind of need to do it manually. Um, so let's say we wanted to make the reference category high risk, then you just need to switch the levels in the label so that they the they list the high risk category first. So again, let's 
Let's restart again with x. x is this vector consisting of a bunch of different um, numerics. And we're going to um, run this line of code, which notice this, it's a subtle difference. But basically, whereas here 0 was first, we've now put 2 first and 0 last. 1 obviously stays this in the middle because it's the moderate risk. And then, of course, we, um, we label the 2 high risk because by, um, by putting 2 first, we're making that or we're forcing that to be the reference category. And we're labeling that reference category high risk. And then, of course, we, we zero is going to be low risk. And we're saying that it's an ordered factor. So let's run that. And again, you see that all the zeros are low risk, all the, all the ones are moderate risk, and all the twos are high risk. But crucially, the actual reference categories has been changed. So now um, high risk is the reference category, and it's less than moderate risk and less than low risk. Okay, um, last set uh, or last type of data are missing values. And um, although it's, I guess, not technically a type of data, it is, it has a special encoding in R, which you need to be aware of. And the way R encodes missing values is with NA. So you see here NA. So let's just create a vector um, with a, a few NAs in it. So you'll see. It creates the vector. There's no error message, um, but there's a bunch of NAs in it. And you can actually ask R to check if there's any missing values in any variable you want. And that's just how you do is.na and then open brackets. And within the brackets, you put the, the object that you want to know if there's missing values in. So you see it returns a bunch of logical statements. So it's false, false, true. So of course, that's not an NA, that's not an NA, that is an NA, so it's false, false, true, etc. Okay, now let's go to actually converting between data types. Uh, so sometimes you might do this. Um, I don't often do this, to be quite honest, but I'm going to show you anyway. Uh, you can actually force R uh, to um, change the data type of a variable. Um, so let's uh, let's just show you exactly what I mean by that. So let's just um, do another example. So we're saying x is this vector of one, two, and three. So these this is obviously a numeric. Oops, this is a numeric one, two, three. And let's say I want to force it to be a character for whatever reason. So I ran that function. You use the as character, and then look what do you know? It made it a character. It put brackets around them. Um, similarly, you can actually force things to be logical statements, and in R, any numerics that are not zero um, are considered true, and any numerics that are zero are considered false. So let's just run this one. So we're saying x is just this little vector of two values, zero and one, and we're going to force it to become a logical. So let's see what it does. It says false because the first one's zero and true because the first one's one. And just so you um, believe me when I say that anything not zero is considered true by R. So now we have a, a vector that's a little bit longer, zero, one, two, three. We're going to force it to be a logical object. And then it's false, true, true, true. Okay. There are some limits, though. You can't, for whatever reason, in R, force character variables to be numeric or logical. So Let's say we'll make a character variable x equal, oops, keep doing that, sorry guys. Um, say x is hello. Um, let's say we want to make it numeric. Oh, we get an error message. NA is introduced by coercion, meaning R just couldn't understand what I was trying to do. So it's just like, I'm just going to put missing values because that doesn't make any sense what Aaron was trying to do. Um, similarly with logicals, again, we just made a, a variable. Um, a character object called hello. Let's try to make it a logical. Um, get NAs. So it can't, it doesn't understand what I was trying to do. Okay. Now, this is actually a really important section data structure. Um, these, yeah, it's a, it's a big concept in programming in general, um, but obviously specifically in R. A data structure is a generic term for anything that can have data. Um, so we've already actually talked about one type of data structure called a vector. Uh, but there's also things called matrices, arrays, data frames, and lists. And we're going to talk about all of those. 
Um, the most important ones, in my opinion, and certainly the ones I use the most, are vectors, data frames, and lists. Okay, so what's a vector? Um, I already told you, it's a sequence of objects, but this is a crucial thing. It has to be the same type of data. Um, vectors can be made in, in different ways, um, but the most common way, at least I do, uh, I create vectors is um, with this C function, uh, which basically constructs uh, a vector. You put all the elements of the vector within the brackets. And as I say here, they're, they're really the building blocks of R since vectors are the way we make data frames and matrices. Um, okay, so here's a couple examples of some vectors. So we're saying X is a bunch of vectors and notice that they're all the same type of data. So X is all numerics. Let's do another a Y. This is all characters. And so you have an object, you know, a bunch of objects. One object says my, another says name, another says is, and another object says Aaron. And then Z is a vector of logicals. So there you go. All right. Now, if you do, for whatever reason, accidentally, of course, um, put different types of data in a vector, R will actually automatically convert them into one data type. Because remember, vectors all need to be the same type of data. So I'll give you an example. So, um, and there, it seems to be, this is what R will always by default do. So if you actually put a, um, a character element within a vector con consisting of numerics, it'll just convert um, the numeric elements into characters. So here we have one character element called hello. And what do you know? It converts even the numerics into characters. Um, Similarly, it'll um, R if you have a logical statement within a vector containing um, or logical elements within a vector containing uh, numerics, it'll just convert those logical elements also into numerics. And again, anything that's that's false will be coded as zero, and anything that's true, um, R will just make one. So I'll show you here. So you see, it, it just made one one three zero five. So it's made the second element is a one because it said true and the um, fourth element is a zero because it said false and then finally automatically converts any logical element into a character if there's a character in the in the vector as well so you see it just turn them all into characters okay that's just more of a word of warning uh just you know be conscientious about how you define your vectors and make sure you only use the same uh, type of data. Matrices. Um, I don't use a lot of matrices in R. Uh, matrices um, are um, really important, naturally, um, in R. But for, you know, nuts and bolts data analysis, which is really what I'm going to be showing you in this tutorial series, I personally don't use them a lot. I'm just going to show you that they exist. This is kind of how they work. But that's basically it, because I personally don't use them. And you're going to learn how at least I code things in R. Um, so um, I'm going to just define a matrix. So here we have X is just a bunch of values that are going to be in the cells. So X, this is a, another way to create a vector. Um, so basically that um, colon is basically, think of it as like, um, is the word two. So from one to 10, uh, make those values. So you see, it just made a vector of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, R names, I just creating a, again, a, a variable. It's totally arbitrary. I could call this whatever I want. I could call it Z. I could call it lollipop. It really doesn't matter. Um, but I like to use labels that make sense to me. So R names, we're making a vector with a bunch of characters in it called A, B, C, D, E. And these are going to be our row names. Hence, I call it R names, like row names. And then similarly, the column names, I define this variable called call names. Again, totally arbitrary. You can, you can call it literally whatever you want, you know, sausage, whatever, um, doesn't matter. Um, but it's going to be a, the names of the columns, which, I'm, which is going to be a vector of two values or two objects, which are characters called outcome and predictor. Um, so you'll see what is our names. It says A, B, C, D, E, F, or A, B, C, D, E. And then call names is outcome and predictor. 
And then this is how you make a matrix. So we sort of define everything we need, and then we put them all together into a matrix. So this is the matrix function. This is a built-in function in R. So you matrix, brackets, and then you define what the data is going to be. So these are the things that are going to be in your cell. You define how many rows are going to be in the matrix, and then how many columns. Naturally, these need to correspond, right? Uh, you need, you know, the amount of data you need, you have needs to be able to be be distributed evenly or not necessarily evenly, but distributed across the, the number of rows and columns. And then dim names is the dimension names. And then list basically just allows me to list what the names are going to be. So I'm saying the dimension names are the row names and then the column names. So let's run this function. And then what do you know? It just made a matrix, which is a two by two or a two dimensional structure. Um, containing objects, again, of the same type. So notice none of the objects within the matrix, which is what I defined as X, X are the objects within the matrix. They're all the, the same thing. In this case, they're all numerics. Um, I'm not gonna go any further into matrices because I, I don't really use them. Um, not for personal reasons. I just, I, there's, another, there's another data structure that I think is much more useful um, for the vast majority of the things that a guy like me is going to be doing in R. And um, the the third, again, I'm, I'm actually not going to go into detail at all about this, is arrays. These are basically matrices, but with more than two dimensions. So, you know, three-dimensional structures, four-dimensional structures. I'm not going to tell you anything about them because I don't use them ever, um, but they definitely are used. Um, some data has a three-dimensional structure. For instance, brain imaging data has a, a three-dimensional structure. Um, in which case you might want to use an array. Um, the thing that I use a lot, and we're going to be using a lot in these tutorials, are data frames. So here we're on line 191. I'm just going to scroll up. So a data frame, you can think of it as a more general version of a matrix. Um, and the reason why it's more general is because uh, different columns can be different types of data. So within a column, you need to have the same type of data, but you can have different types of data um, in different columns. So one column might be numeric, another column might be factors, another column might be characters, another column might be logical statements um, or, or just logicals. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that offers a lot of versatility. And if you have already now some, if you already have, experience with data analysis, you realize that that's probably what you're going to be using a lot. It's a uh, two-dimensional structure with multiple types of data that you can have, um, which is often what most of the data that at least uh, most people will have, or is often the, the structure of most of the type of data that people um, who do research will be using. So uh, let's actually make a data frame. So this is, of course, fake data. Um, so let's start by making a vector of participant ID numbers. So I'm just calling this, again, totally arbitrary label ID um, of numbers 1 to 10. So let's just, just so you see what I'm doing, um, 1 to 10. Now, uh, we're going to make some outcome data. And again, for the purposes of teaching, I'm going to make a continuous outcome, a dichotomous outcome, and an ordinal outcome. So. Let's start with the continuous outcome. We're just going to make a random sequence of numbers from 1 to 100. Um, and then, you know, R has this built-in function to do that. It's literally um, this R unif just means a, a random uniform distribution. And then the first says, how many uh, numbers do I want? And then sort of the minimum, uh, sort of the range of, uh, of, number, of numbers that I'm going to sort of randomly generate. So anywhere between one and 100, I want 10 numbers that are that are uh, random between that range. So, and we're calling that that variable continuous underscore outcome. Again, totally arbitrary, but I'm using a meaningful label because again, I'm all about making my life easier. So when I look at my code, I understand what I was doing. So I just ran that little line of code. Let's actually see what happened. So you see it are generated a bunch of random numbers between one and uh, uh, one and 100, and there's 10 of them. So that's great. Um, but I don't like all those decimal points. So let's actually round them off. So there's a built-in function called round, and it's just you round, open brackets, and you put the actual variable that you want to round, and then you um, define how many digits 
um, or decimal places you want to round it to. So let's round that function and see what happens. You see it just basically rounded it to two digits. So a little bit more um, easy on the eyes and the brain to understand. Um, similarly, now let's make our dichotomous outcome. So again, we're going to use what are called dummy codes. So zeros and ones to code for different groups. So the first thing we're going to do is, again, generate a random sequence of zeros and ones for a total of 10 um, numbers, right? Because we that's the amount of participants we have. So um, this is the function. It's called sample. And then again, I do a little, I define a little vector. I'm like sample this vector um, with replacement, um, which just basically allows me to have multiple zeros and ones for a total of 10 times. So let's see what happens. We're calling this dichotomous outcome. Let's see what that did. So yeah, we got a random uh, sequence of uh, zeros and ones, which is nice. Now, because this is going to be a dichotomous grouping outcome variable, um, we want to actually define the factors. So we already know this function, so I'm not going to dwell on it, but you say we're going to factor the dichotomous outcome, we define the levels, and we give labels. So no violence will be zero, and violence will be one, and just by default, the reference category will be zero. So let's actually run that line of code, see what R did, and boom, look, we got all the ones are coded as violence, all the zeros are coded as no violence. And this is a little redundant since the reference category, as you can see here, is no violence, but I'm going to just use the relevel function just to be OCD and say, and make sure that the reference category is um, no violence. And again, that's the basically doesn't change anything because the reference category was already no violence. Great. Now for our ordinal variable, we're doing, the, it's the same idea of generating a random sequence of zero, one, or two, which are going to be dummy codes for an ordinal um, variable. Uh, and again, with replacement, we want 10 of them. So we make this little vector, zero, one, and two, and we're just basically saying randomly sample zero, one, or two with replacement 10 times. Great. We're going to call that ordinal outcome. And then let's see what it did. Perfect. We got a bunch of, we got a zero, one zero, a bunch of twos, and a one. And that was all random. And then again, because this is our ordinal um, outcome, we're going to define the levels of it. And um, we're going to set the reference category. Um, and uh, we're telling R that this is an ordered um, factor. So let's run that. Let's see what happened. Look at that. It's wonderful. The zero is low risk, which is our reference category. The ones are moderate risk, and then the twos are high risk. Great. So we have our three outcome variables. Now let's just make some fake um, predictor variables. We're going to make two. First, we're going to use dummy codes for predictor number one to define the groups. I'm just going to just to show you how you can use dummy codes to define groups. And then um, the second we're going to define groups using character elements, but it's basically the same thing. So predictor one, this is called the rep function, or, or you think it's repetition um, or repeat. I actually can't remember what it stands for, but repeat, repetition, same thing. Um, it's a very simple function. You basically say repeat this element X number of times, in which case five. So we're, we make this element which is a vector consisting of two values, so zero and one, and we want to repeat it five times, so basically two times five. So we're going to have zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, um, for a total of five times, which makes 10 values of zero and one. So again, this is just dummy codes that we're making or defining in preparation to turn them into factored variables. So you, you see just a bunch of zeros and ones, and now we're going to factor them and zero is going to be the reference category which is going to which we label control and one is going to be the case you can kind of see what happened case control case control case control and the first the first label there is our says that that's going to be the reference category again just being ocd we're going to make sure using the relevel function that the reference category is the um label control and obviously that doesn't change anything because it already was and then for predictor two same idea um except we're now this is a little bit um 
go through this carefully. We have a vector, and within the vector, we have two um, uh, re uh, functions, which are the repeated functions. We have one, which is here, one, and then the second one is here. So we're saying there's a vector, and within that vector, there's two elements, and each of those elements is going to consist of a repetition of the word male five times, and the second one is the repetition of the word female five times. So what we should have is a uh, overall vector that has male five times followed by female five times. And that's exactly what we see. Perfect. And we're going to factor that as we've done before. And because male is the first category, it's going to be the reference category. And naturally, as you can see, it is the reference category because it's the first level listed. But let's say we want to actually make female the reference category. We can, we can force R to do that using the relevel function where we say make predictor 2, the reference category be female. And then let's look at predictor 2 now. You see that it actually switched the reference category to female, but didn't actually switch the order of the, the values in the vector or in the factor. Okay, now let's actually make a data frame. So a data frame, uh, you use this data frame function. So data data dot frame open bracket, and we're we're making a arb, again arbitrary label, but I like to use meaningful labels. So my data is this data frame, and in it we're just going to put all the things we just ma made. The I, the ID labels are our three outcome variables and our two predictor variables. And it should be a, um, a two-dimensional uh, structure. And we, as you can see, we got multiple different types of data. We got a numeric, uh, we got a bunch of, new, we got two numerics, we got a, a, a factor variable, we got an ordinal variable, and then we got two other factor variables. Perfect. Let's actually see what it looks like. So we'll just run my data. Let me actually expand this so you can see it a bit better. There you go. So look at that, very, very nice. We have uh, sort of our, this is our data set. We got 10 observations. They got, we got the different outcomes and we got our predictors. Now, um, I'm just gonna show you, there's a very useful function I use a lot because sometimes you have very long data. You might have hundreds, maybe even thousands of observations and uh, it's just gonna overload the memory of your computer and actually R can't uh, display, you know, has an upper limit of how much it can actually display of your data if you have this very long data frame. So if you just want to look at the first few rows, you can use this function called head. Uh, so you basically do head, open bracket, and then put the, the data frame uh, uh, label in it, and then it'll just show you the first few rows. So in this case, it shows me the first six rows. Okay. We have a whole tutorial on actually exploring a data frame, so I'm not going to really go into it, but this is a very useful function. I use it a lot called structure, S-T-R, and then you put the the um, the uh, object that you want to know the structure of. So let's just run that structure, my data, and it looks very intimidating, but there's order to the chaos. So it's just showing you here the different uh, uh, elements within uh, uh, the, or the structure of the data frame. So you got different uh, columns. It tells you what type of data they are, and it tells you the values. And for the factored variables, it tells you how many levels, um, and then also tells you uh, you know which one's the reference category. Similarly, attributes or not similarly, but attributes kind of to give you similar information tells you the, the different names of the uh, variables within this data frame, what it actually, this type of object is, it's a data frame, and it tells you the names of the rows. Okay, let's open this up so you can see that. A list, okay. We're not gonna go into lists in this tutorial um, because we actually will spend time going into what a list is and how to explore it in um, actually tutorial number five when we talk about linear regressions. But lists are, are another very common data structure that you're going to encounter. And they are an ordered collection of a variety of different objects. Uh -oh. 
excuse me. <clears throat> um, so it could be numerics, character, logical factors, whatever. And, and basically lists allow you to combine a lot of different types of information into one variable. And yeah, I'm not going to go into any more detail because we're going to spend time exploring one with a concrete example. Um, otherwise, if I show you now, it's just going to confuse you. All right. And then for your uh, interest and reference, I, I'm just going to scroll down, not to overwhelm you, but I've actually listed a bunch of built-in, very useful functions. These are all of them. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to bore you by going through one, each one line by line, but just for your reference, I've actually typed out all the different functions, obviously with comments, um, just so you know what they are. So uh, there's logical operators. So less than, less than or equal to is this symbol. Greater than, greater than or equal to. We've already encountered this one, exactly equal to. Um, R actually has a symbol if you want to say, is it not? And that's the exclamation mark. So not equal to is exclamation mark with, with the equal sign. Uh, similarly, if you want to say, is something not X, then you use, you know, the exclamation mark followed by the object X. Um, another logical operator is or and and. So or is encoded with this straight line. And then and you just use the and symbol. There's also built-in arithmetic operators. Again, very self-explanatory. Um, I will spend some time just showing you the useful mathematical functions. So you can manually calculate a bunch of stuff. Uh, you can calculate the mean, the standard deviation, the variance, the median, the quartiles, sum, the range, the minimum, maximum. Some functions actually have what's called na.remove, which is a, a logical statement. You can either be true or false. And uh, it just allows you to say, tell the function, listen, I want you to perform that this process, but I want you to either remove or not remove the missing values. So I'll give you an example. So x is a vector with a bunch of missing values in it. So let's just run x, show you got a few missing values in it. Let's say I, we'll use the built-in mean function. So I want to say, what's the mean of X? I get uh, basically an error message. It's just as NA. The reason why is because, at least for this function, you need to actually define uh, NA.remove as true, because otherwise uh, it basically won't be able to calculate the mean properly. It needs to calculate the mean after removing all of the um, missing values. So let's run this code again but with NA remove true, and there's the mean of that vector. Um, you can also get the absolute value, the square root. Um, you've already seen the round function, so you round x to the nth digit. You can get the natural logarithm of x, the common logarithm of x, and the exponential of x. <clears throat> uh, yeah. And other useful functions, uh, again, this is going to, you'll see a lot of these when in our tutorial on exploring data frames, but um, you can get the length of a vector. So um, just to show you, I'll just type it in here. So length of X is 10, because um, there's 10 values. You can get the dimensions of a matrix or data frame. So let's, again, dim my underscore data. It's 10 rows by six columns. We've already seen structure in attributes. Um, you can similarly get the, get the class of an object. Um, you can get the names of an object. Um, we've already seen this uh, C um, function, which basically allows you to combine various objects into a vector. And then uh, um, you can also combine various objects into columns or rows with the C bind and the R bind function. Um, uh, yeah. And then we've already seen the, um, the repeat function. So repeat X, Y number of times. Another thing you'll see in later tutorials, I use this function, particularly with plots. Um, you can generate a sequence of numbers from X to Y by intervals of Z. So let's just do sequence um, from 1 to 10 by 0 0.5. It basically generates a sequence um, by that. And you can kind of see why I might use that in plots if I want to create axis 
tick marks at certain um, intervals. And then finally, I'm not going to do this because I want to actually keep the console, but you can actually, um, you know, our console is now like full of a bunch of stuff. And let's say you really don't like that. You can actually just clear the console, but it won't actually remove any of the stored objects. So these are the things that you've defined. But uh, so you can just run that function. And then if you wanted to actually clear the entire um, uh, environment of all the objects that you have. So I'll show you. If you look here, this is our environment. We've defined all these different variables and, and whatnot. Uh, you can actually delete all of that if you are if you so desire with this function. You just run it. I'm not going to do that. Okay, uh, we are actually almost there. There's not much left to talk about. Um, uh, so, how do you actually install and load packages? So, um, if this is the first time you're using R, you're going to be installing a lot of packages at the beginning. To install packages, you basically run this function: install dot packages open bracket. Um, or you have a set of brackets, and then you use quotation marks and you put the package name in there. So I'll give an example. Let's go to the console. I've obviously installed this package before, but this is a very common one called Psych. Really great package. It's got a bunch of different um, useful functions. And then you, you do that and you click enter, and then it'll install. And that's kind of what it looks like when you install it. I've already installed it, so it doesn't really make a difference, but that's how you install. And then this is important. I want to emphasize. So you only need to install your packages once. Um, and once you've installed them, you don't need to rerun that, that, that line of code again. But every time you start R, you need to actually load the packages that you want to use, uh, for whatever data analysis. So, um, yeah. So uh, the way you actually load a package to actually use it, um, you need to use this library function. So you library, you type library bracket, and then you put the package name. So in this case, we'll just type it here. So library, oops, library. Um, and you don't need to use the, um, you don't need to use the quotation. So we'll do library psych. And let's just run that. And then you can see it just loaded it. So if there's any functions that I, uh, I from the psych package that I want to use, I have to do library psych to load the package in order to do that. If I don't actually do that, I'll get an error message because R will be like, I don't know what function you want me to do because you haven't loaded the package that you need. And that's that's about it um, for installing and loading packages. Okay. Uh, Let's now uh, go to the second last section, which is sort of my method of troubleshooting problems. I very often run into problems with R, uh, and that's just because I'm I'm not the smartest computer programmer. Um, but uh, yeah, and the great thing about R, which I really love, is that in many ways it's kind of the Wikipedia of statistical software. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with the paid statistical software like SPSS or SAS. They're wonderful. But, you know, just like Wikipedia, uh, people thought it would be a really bad product because you don't pay any money for it. But turns out that Wikipedia is the best encyclopedia that has ever been created and has very high quality information. Because if you democratize knowledge, you get a bunch of really smart people who are super interested in their particular field and they want to um, share that knowledge with others. And it's the same principle, I believe, with R. You have some really smart people who are really interested in stats and developing software so people can analyze data. And um, yeah, so there's just this, I would say, unparalleled troubleshooting uh, capacity for R because there's literally hundreds, if not thousands of people using R, posting online, and I guarantee you that someone had the same problem that you that you have, and and someone way smarter than me solved it for them. And you can sort of solve your problem by reading what they recommend. So the first thing I recommend, if you ever encounter a problem, is literally Google search R and then type in the problem you have. And there's a variety of forums um, and and whatnot, and and just click through. And I, I do encourage you to look at multiple sources of information. YouTube also has some helpful videos. Um, uh, uh, and I encourage you to really kind of use multiple different uh, sources of information so that you really understand how to solve that problem. 
And uh, I think you'll find that that actually solves most of the issues that you'll that you'll encounter. The second thing um, I do is actually look up the packages PDF. So uh, each uh, package has a, uh, a PDF, which is online. So if you search the package's name and type in PDF after it, you'll you can actually open the PDF and look through the various functions to help troubleshoot the problem. Um, you can also look up the function in our documentation, which is a website. Uh, so I've got these examples here. You can you can do that um, with the code yourself on your own computers. Uh, you and some functions actually, or some so, um, R packages have their own homepage. So ggplot, which is something we're going to use in this tutorial series a lot. It's a really amazing um, software to make. I would say very beautiful plots, and they have a whole web a whole a whole website uh, that. Uh, has instructions on how to use that particular package to make the plots that you want to make. And then finally, quick R. It's this, uh, I'm not sure if it's that popular, but I stumbled across it. And I honestly, I still turn to it sometimes when I'm like, how do you do that particular thing? It's pretty, it's pretty basic, but you know, uh, sometimes you need to go back to the fundamentals or remind yourself of the fundamentals. So there's the website. Um, and they actually have a kind of tutorial on there. So you might consider, especially if you're new to R, um, taking a look at it. Okay, we're almost done. Um, last thing, how do you disable scientific notation? So this is the function. I'm not gonna explain it to you, but you just run it. It changes the default options. So you run it and then that's how you turn off scientific notation. Okay, we made it. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for tuning in. And I look forward to um, chatting with you guys next time.